So, hi. <laughs> My name is Steve Teresi. I'm the Director of Training and Technical Support here at JL Audio. I am in South Florida, where we may have some South Florida-like weather in a little bit. Rain in the afternoon is normal. Uh, I am joined today by Mr. Kevin Ferry, joining us from the greater Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Please say hello, Kevin. Hello, everybody. Excellent. And the man of the hour, the man, the myth, the legend, it's Mr. Rob Haynes, joining from Southern California, where it's beautiful, I hear. Please say hello, Rob. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. All right. We got a fun session today. It's one of our technical sessions. We're going to be, <clears throat> pardon me, focusing in on uh, speaker installations. Uh, obviously, we're focusing in on door speakers and mid-range drivers, mid-base drivers and that kind of thing. But we're going to give some tips and tricks and techniques for pretty much all types of installation. So this is not a brand specific thing, although we'll use our brand an awful lot. Um, but Rob put together a really great presentation for us. I'm going to stop talking now and let him take it over. Go ahead, Rob. All right, thank you, Steve. And uh, let me just make sure we're good. Everyone sees my session agenda? We got it. All right, perfect. We're there. All right, so um, as Steve mentioned, uh, today's su subject is gonna really be on proper speaker installation. And this is a really important topic to discuss. You know, We've talked a lot throughout our online training sessions about how to properly set up amplifiers, subwoofer enclosure design, techniques to get everything out of your subwoofers. And uh, now we're going to take that and move it to our loudspeaker category. You know, really make sure that when you're investing in a pair of quality speakers, whether it's an entry level type C1 product all the way up to C7, it doesn't matter. They all deserve the same installation treatment to ensure you're truly getting everything out of the speaker. So we are going to talk about the importance of why it, 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 it's key to have a good installation with your speakers. And again, not just for the doors as Steve discussed, we'll talk about also the rear deck and dash mounted locations, tweeters. Uh, the big focus is gonna be on the better practices. We have a, a good six or seven steps we're gonna run through that really should be part of every speaker installation and what we're gonna do for each of those scenarios and what the benefits that we're gonna gain from it. Uh, we'll have a, a discussion at the end. Uh, if you are on a budget, what's better to invest in a, a higher level pair of speakers or a higher level installation with a, maybe a step down uh, when it comes to choosing the speaker. So we'll talk about what's going to give you the best performance uh, if you are doing a speaker install on a budget. And of course, any questions at the end, you guys always have some killer questions for us. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely answer those at the end if Steve or Kevin aren't able to get to them during the, uh, uh, throughout the chat itself. So with that said, let's get going. And first, why do you really want to invest in your speaker installation? And when I talk about investing in your speaker install, I'm not talking about just paying for whatever a basic install is, you know, throwing it in a door. We're going to talk about uh, items that improve the mid-base response and overall output. A big one for me is reduction in rattles and vibrations and unwanted noises, especially for a, a high quality system. You know, you're using a demo vehicle or something along those lines. One rattle can just kill it. I know for me, when I'm in a car, the car could sound phenomenal. And the moment I hear something I know that's not supposed to be there from the car itself, it kills it for me. That's all I hear at that point. So that's th the things we're gonna talk about today are gonna be key in eliminating those unwanted noises. We're gonna talk about why we want to reduce back waves inside the door and how that can cause phase related cancellations. All of these aspects are all about maximizing the performance of the speaker, making it louder inside the vehicle, getting all of that mid bass out of that six and a half inch driver. But you gotta remember, it also makes tuning easier if you're using a DSP based system. So if you have a VXI or a Tweak or any other DSP processor out there, DSP cannot fix a poor installation. So for, you know, for me, a DSP tuned system, the first step isn't tuning, it's proper installation. It's having properly installed speakers. It's having your amps dialed in properly. It's making sure there's no noises or a loud noise floor or stuff like that into the system. So if you're doing DSP based stuff, you have to get the speaker installed dialed in or it's gonna make tuning really difficult and you probably will never get to the levels that you're wanting to because of the deficiencies in the install. So it's hey, very Rob, before important. you move on. Yeah. 
there's two things I wanted to share. First, when manufacturers such as JL Audio design their products, we design them in an environment that is fairly well controlled. We know that we're going to put them in a car, so we'll put them in a car and we'll do listening. But very often, the cars that we put them in, we've already done a lot of that work. So if you want to get the kind of performance that the manufacturer intended from the product, what Rob's going to share with us is kind of part of the deal. If you don't do that, you're going to get less than what the manufacturer suggested. That's kind of a hint to what Rob's going to talk about at the very end. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to mention is you, you talked about buzzes and rattles and um, any vibrational issues. Nothing will destroy the illusion of your center image more than a speaker buzzing. If you've got everything dialed in right and you've got that phantom center image where it sounds like all the, you know, the good stuff is coming from the center in the right location, you know, where it's supposed to be. If then the right speaker buzzes, suddenly all you hear is the right speaker and the entire thing just collapses. So proper installation really can help everything sound better, like the manufacturer intended for the speakers that you install and like the recording is intended when you go to play it back. Once you hear a speaker, you ruin the whole illusion and it's a terrible mm -hmm. thing. So... Rob's got good stuff. I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> Very good point. Thanks, Steve. All right. So what are the best practices for installing a speaker? And uh, we're going to break down each of these. But the things that we really want to see in a proper speaker installation are doors or rear decks that are deadened. So using sound damping, not dampening. We're not getting stuff wet. Sound damping material. And we're going to mention, you know, we're not uh, here to, you know, sponsor or promote uh, you know all of these different brands there's tons of brands out there but this would be you know, you know using pop popular names most people have probably heard of stuff like dynamat uh sound skins hush mat material that goes on the doors to really make them solid uh, we're gonna look at back wave cancellation we want to make sure the doors really are are real giant enclosures really so we want to seal off all of the big openings that are there that allow access to the inside of the door. And don't worry, we'll discuss how to make the insides accessible. Uh, the other thing that I see often that doesn't get done is a properly mounted speaker. So creating a proper baffle to seal the door for the speaker to attach to, making sure that speaker is properly sealed to the baffle with a gasket, and then decoupling the speaker. And we'll break down each of these. So if you're not familiar with what some of those are, don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna break them down here. So let's actually start with sound deadening material. Why do we want to use this on our doors or on our rear deck? Uh, you know, in a large base system, you would probably wanna also look at doing your, your trunk or your, your rear section if it's an SUV, the, the roof or floors. But what, what it's gonna do is overall improve our speaker performance um you know if you think about a tin can when or a mailbox you know um maybe you've seen this display at some of the car stereo shops you've gone to if you knock on a metal mailbox it's metallic there's an echo to it it sounds tinny it's not solid and um i want to say it was dynamat back in the day had a display where they had a mailbox and the second mailbox and the one mailbox had dynamat or whatever company it was, their material on the inside. And when you knocked on the two different mailboxes, ting, 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 dunk, dunk, dunk. And that- Can you do that one more time, Rob? Dunk, dunk, dunk. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like the one that they had the, the two bells where they would yeah. ring one bell and then you ring the other and the other you know, one with the damping material, or in this case, it was dynamite. It was just a click, click, click. So yeah. I, I thought that was really good, you know, the, the ringing effect. But any one of those demonstrations you know, proves what Rob is talking about here. I had one at my store that was two metal trash cans and one had uh, sound deadening material throughout the inside and the other didn't. And then they had subwoofers installed to the front of them. And you would, could, you would hit a, a, a switch and a tone would play through it. And when the subwoofer would play the tone on the non-deadened trash can, it sounded like a vibrating tin can. And when you played the one with the deadening material, you didn't have that vibration or rattle, that tinniness. So the whole idea of deadening our doors is to exactly do that, make them more solid, prevent unwanted resonant noises that can happen from rattles and vibrations. Um, that overall is gonna give us more output. It's gonna improve the mid-bass response. The other nice things is it can help reduce the road noise as well. The doors typically on a car are gonna be the thinnest material out of the metal you know body 
and very easy for road noise to come in, especially a larger vehicle, a truck or a SUV with bit larger tires and all of that. So it's going to help quiet down the inside, which, of course, makes the audio sound louder as well. Um, and again, don't just think about the doors. Uh, you know, we're going to we're gonna have a couple a picture that we'll show a rear deck. But the rear deck is key as well, especially if we're doing subwoofers. But even for our speakers, just to kind of deaden the area around where the speaker installs to remove or kill some of that extra energy, a more powerful speaker uh, is going to you know, potentially produce compared to a lower powered factory speaker. So when we're applying this deadening material, um, I always think the most important place to start is the outer skin, which is ironically going to be the inside of the door but it's the outer skin because it's technically on the other side the outside of the door if that makes sense so here's a picture of my old honda civic when i was uh, living by the jail audio office and uh, i mean that thing was just like a tin can inside the car was loud once i ripped off the plastic cover um, i mean there's nothing to, to stop road noise from coming in the car there's nothing to deaden the door from the factory so the first thing i did before eric cole put my system in was uh, get it all deadened up. So using, um, I forget what I used here, but you know, again, going back to those comparisons, after I applied the, the sound deadening material to the inside of the door, knocking on the outside of it, it was like knocking on a tank. It solidified the door to where it didn't rattle, it didn't vibrate, it didn't flex as much. And you know, I like to think of it as, if you think about subwoofers, let's say you have a, a big 13W7, and you put it in a small enclosure, uh, a half inch MDF enclosure. That W7, it's going to create a lot of back pressure. And if we don't have a solid enclosure, we're probably seeing that half inch MDF. It's probably going to flex. It's going to move. It's not going to retain pressure the way we want it to. Compared to if you had it in a one inch MDF enclosure where it's solid, it's rigid. We don't have a loss of our, our space performance because of of leakiness because the enclosure is moving. It's very similar how I look at it with the sound deadening material. Instead of having this weak, flimsy door that could flex or move under pressure, it's solid now. It's going to hold up to that. It's going to also, again, reduce the noise, give me that improvement in output. So this is kind of what you want to see. After you have that outer skin done, then you can move to the inner skin, which is going to be the part of the door behind the door panel. Now, there's a couple of ways to look at this. This is a great example that Ken Smith from Superior Auto Sounds in West Texas um, sent to me. Here they've got the entire uh, outer skin of the door completely covered. This is great. It helps, again, further reduce road noise coming in, but also the rattles, the vibrations. It just kills that extra energy we may not want from the speaker uh, in the door. Now, this is a pretty um, substantial job on the inside. He's got everything covered, which is great if you can do that. Um, sometimes you don't always have uh, maybe amount of material, or if you have a relatively solid door, um, this is a great example. Matt from our R&D department, uh, by strategically placing the sound deadening material in a pattern on the door, this is a great way, again, to get the job done but be a little more conscious on the materials, a little friendlier on the wallet, which we all love. Um, uh, I know my wife appreciates that. She didn't <laughs> like when I bought, you know, almost a thousand dollars worth of deadening material for my last two cars. So I, maybe I could so have made Rob, her a little happy if I went that route. <laughs> Rob, on that note, um, yes. no pun intended here, that's why I like that bell demonstration and that garbage mm -hmm. can one that you talked about. Um, as There's also one that's got like a gong and things like that. There's all kinds of really cool demonstrations, but you'll notice in most of the cases, they don't cover the entire object Mm -hmm. with the material they'll usually just put a small amount on and i remember the bell it was literally just like yeah. size of a, a u.s quarter roughly that they would put on there so you can still see most of the bell and you still got a dramatic improvement so uh, what matt's showing here in this image thank you for putting it up there rob uh, what matt is doing is he's using less material and technically he's not getting as much coverage but he's getting enough coverage that it makes a huge difference mm -hmm. especially compared to not doing it Yep. Um, I've uh, I've had the opportunity actually to work with Matt and do a very similar pattern on a, a couple of cars that I worked on. Yes, I worked on cars. Uh, <laughs> scary. Um, but it had a huge effect, and it's not quite tank-like like Rob was describing, but it made a big, big difference on a couple of vehicles that I was working on. So you don't have to go as crazy as some of the images that Rob is sharing and still get a really big, really big improvement. 
Yeah, I was actually really happy that Matt shared this image um, because, yeah, like I said, you don't always have to use it all. Um, sometimes it's, it's you know, you have what you have. This is better than nothing. But I know if this left our facility, uh, it was where it needed to be. So, um, you know, I really good job, Matt, for sharing that. And next time I'm in Florida, I'll give you a tug on your beard or something. <laughs> <laughs> and also, sometimes you don't have the ability to completely line every square inch of the door face, though, too. You know, you have tolerances between the door panel and that inner uh, door panel skin there and all of that stuff. So you need to make sure that everything fits properly and all of that good stuff, too. And there's going to be places probably on that uh, the inside skin inside, you know, the inside inside skin that you can't get your arm into and things like that. And uh, and you. I mean, you're, you're just not going to be able to get to them or you might not be able to do it because of tolerance reasons. So um, don't worry about it if you can't get it or for whatever reason, as long as you're getting that majority coverage like we see here, you're, you're going to get a great result. Especially because he's done a few things we're going to talk about in just a couple of moments, too. So it all kind of it works when you do all of the steps together. <laughs> But again, don't forget the rear deck. We're not only talking about door speaker installations here. Um, again, these are some pictures from my old Civic. And this might be overkill for just rear speakers. Oh, yeah, yeah, think oh, on. <laughs> but anytime you've got a, a substantial base system, I think this is without a doubt. You know, I had a Honda, it was a 2014 Civic. They're not the most, you know, tank-like cars. And uh I didn't have a single rattle, noise, annoyance in that car with a H, uh, W6 HO enclosure. And uh, at one point, one of our E112 home subwoofers on a thousand watts in a car box. Um, not a single rattle because that whole deck was done. But if this was only for a speaker install, maybe you've got like a, a smaller base system in there that's not creating a lot of energy. At the bare minimum, get that deadening material around the speaker install itself. Maybe around um, use that strategic method we just showed on Matt's picture where you have it, you know, strategic strips placed throughout the deck. We just want to kill that energy that could cause those unwanted uh, noises or leakage of air or other uh, aspects like that. The next thing we want to look at is reducing back wave cancellations. Well, what does that mean? We got to remember speakers don't play in one direction. The cone moves in and out. So yeah, what we hear when the speaker moves out, we hear, right? It's playing into the car. But when the speaker moves back in, the backside of the speaker is creating sound waves as well. And those sound waves, when they get inside the door, can do some things we don't want. They can reflect. They can come back through the speaker and cause phase-related or uh, distortion-related issues. So if you look at this example here, we have a speaker mounted to our door plays into the car or truck, that's great. But remember, we have the back waves also. And especially if it's a flat surface right behind the door, remember mid mid range, higher frequencies, the higher we go in the frequency domain, the more directional it's gonna be. So if we have like a, a higher mid range type frequency, it's very, very common. And I would say expected for those back waves to come right off that door and come right back through the speaker. And now we have phase related issues because we're having those frequencies coming through at different points in time. There's also, uh, you know, potential for some uh, other noises we may not want through the speaker. Um, with the lower frequencies, it'll, it'll mess with the pressure in the door. So really what we want to see is by, we want to eliminate essentially the back waves from coming back to the speaker and coming out of the speaker. So a great way to do that is to place something behind the speaker on the door uh, I would say additional to the sound deadening material that's going to kill those back waves or deflect them to the point where they're not going to interfere with the speaker itself. And some ways to do that are there's kits designed uh, specifically to get rid of the back waves from a speaker. Um, I know Hushmat has a kit. I think Sound Shield, I think, has a kit. There, there's kits out there um, that will are specific for it. Typically, it's a closed cell foam square or a, a rubber angled tile that, again, will deflect the energy. A lot of the um, foam speaker ring kits, fast rings, and um, some of the other ring kits out there, typically they'll come with a foam kind of big, thick foam puck in the middle. That's designed for the back uh, waves as well. My only concern with the foam 
pucks that come with those kits is you got to be aware of any potential moisture in the door. So if you're in a rain heavy area, that's just asking to potentially become a giant sponge. And we definitely don't want that. So if you worry about moisture in the area, um, I would say look at using closed cell foam, uh, maybe find some uh, pro audio, some studio or uh, rubber type tiles that can uh, be installed as well and make sure that those will help kind of eliminate the back waves from coming through. And again, sound deadening material will help, but it won't do as good of a job as a dedicated closed cell foam or rubber. But really what we wanna do is kill or deflect those back waves to keep them from coming back through the speaker and causing potential issues uh, due to all of that. Hey Rob, real quick before you, you yes. move on, there was a comment earlier in the chat. Uh, someone said that they went to a local hardware store to acquire some materials that they use to take care of some of the things that you've already talked about. And I think that's a, it's an interesting point because there are similar materials that you can get for these applications. And you mm -hmm. kind of went through a couple of different ideas there. The one thing that I've noticed though, and I just wanted to share this, bearing in mind that the company I represent doesn't offer any of these items, but the <laughs> car audio companies, the ones that make it specifically for our environment, they have done a lot of research into the mm -hmm. temperatures that happen inside of cars. That skin that Rob was talking about, both the inner and the outer, I know down here in Florida, it gets unbelievably hot. And I've seen some of these materials where that just slides down into the bottom of the door because the adhesive doesn't hold up. You may not be in an environment that's quite as harsh, but just know that there are differences between a, a product that's designed for this type of an environment and those that are not. Your, your mileage may vary. You may be able to get away with it, but just know that there could be potentially some significant differences. Yep. Yeah, when I lived in uh, Phoenix for, for quite some time, and I would do the, the roof well, the, skin. The whole outer skin would melt there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would do the roof skin, and one time I pulled the headliner down to do something, and two pieces had fallen down just because they had melted off on there. But I did want to add something. You know, when we were all talking about this earlier today and going through and, and talking about some of these environmental things, I went through and I looked at a couple websites um, for, for the companies that make these types of products and it's interesting there's a there's a few companies that make those um, specific back plates that we're talking about now that, that go right behind the speaker and they have them listed as waterproof um, specifically um, okay. so pretty cool to Perfect. see and, and 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 understand and know that that is labeled there they have done some testing in it and they know what kind of environments that these pieces are gonna get into so it's kind of nice to see that on there too it's a good answer. Oh, that's awesome thanks Kevin all right, so moving on, the next thing we need to look at is sealing off any openings, which means having um, those openings we were looking at earlier in the door, we want to get rid of those. We really want to make the door a, a big giant enclosure. Uh, this is really important when we start getting in to the lower frequencies, the mid bass. Um, you know, essentially we want to create a giant sealed infinite baffle. <laughs> <laughs> enclosure, I guess you can look at it. But by sealing off those openings, especially under high power, it's really going to have a big impact with your mid base. Um, it's again, forcing that energy into the cabin and preventing loss. Um, again, it'll also help with rattles and vibrations. Any waves that are inside the door would stay in the door. They're not coming out through those openings and hitting the door panels or clips or, you know, cables and stuff that can cause, cause unwanted rattles. So um, this is typically what a door looks like, right? You take off your door panel, take off the cheap plastic they have glued. Some of them now are trying to do some deadening. Um, you know, my car had uh, like kind of white, almost foam pillows that uh, took up those openings. Um, so, you know, the factory tries, but for an aftermarket system, where in most cases we're doubling, if not tripling the power, going to larger speakers, it's probably not going to cut the mustard when it comes to maintaining pressure uh, in the door. So what we want to do to get rid of those openings, there's two options. The preferred option is that you create specific panels that are size or shape specific for those openings and they're going to perfectly cover the opening and you're going to secure it with you know uh, uh, proper bolts or you know nut certs with rib nuts but we don't want them permanently attached to the door because we need to make sure a mechanic or dealership can still have access to the inside of the door 
for any potential maintenance that may, the, the door or vehicle may need, whether it's a, a door lock cable or, you know, a harness or whatever that case may be. The other thing about the, these uh, panels we want to make is don't use wood. We need something that's heavy duty, a heavy duty plastic, acrylic, something that's not going to warp or distort that could cause leakage. You know, last thing we want is a panel to swell out and not only cause, you know, leakage from the door that affects our performance, but then push against a panel, add stress to the clips and potential other things in that uh, panel or door that could uh, break. So um, the reason that's important is, you know, here's again a picture of my car when I lived in Florida and you can see there's a good amount of moisture inside the door. So the, that was the first thing I noticed when I took my door panel off, took off the plastic sheet material was the inside of my door was wet. And it's not just on the bottom. If you look at all of these circles, that's moisture. And these two down here would concern me because if I had a wood panel placed there to seal the door, that panel's right against that ledge or lip where there's water sitting. And that's asking over time, especially with those heavy Florida rains. Steve's probably expecting any minute now. That's <laughs> asking that it wood to just yeah, <laughs> essentially turn into a sponge and soak it and start to swell. So that's why we want to do plastic acrylic based materials. I just saw on the Facebook chat, Glenn Savage said quarter inch ABS for the wind. So there you go. But this is a so, great hey, example. Rob, yeah. Rob, real quick, if you can go back one image. That one, uh, put the circles back on because I think it's a really important point. And I, this is going to sound silly and you guys have got to either laugh at me or laugh with me. The water that's down at the bottom of the door is what a lot of people are aware of. They know that there's drain holes down there to let that water out, of course. And we, when we talk about putting um, passive crossover networks inside the door panel, they say, yeah, but I don't put it down there because I know the water's there. So I put it up higher. Like, you mean <laughs> on the bar where the water droplets are? Because the water is coming down from somewhere. It's not coming up from the bottom. So moisture is all over on the inside of the door. Mm -hmm. There was also a comment a few moments ago in the chat about you you can't make the door airtight. You, and I don't think you want to for this reason. Water yeah. has to go somewhere. So the, the way to get the best performance is to try to minimize the amount of uh, air transfer from inside the door cavity to inside the vehicle. You still want that that water to be able to drain out. It's going to be there. Let it go somewhere. Just try to create uh, the best environment that you can. And the better you do that, using the technique that Rob's uh, about to talk about in terms of covering some of those panels, the better the performance will be. Perfect. All right. So, um, again, the examples from Scott up at Vibe Car Audio in uh, – Red Deer, Alberta, Canada. And you can see once they're installed, they perfectly fit on this door. They perfectly seal the openings. You can see the nice stainless steel hardware that's mounting it. That way they can easily be removed. But again, if you look at these, and here's an example from my car that uh, Ramel Medina did, um, Audio Fabricator on Instagram. But you can see the strategic cutouts for the cables for the door handle to go inside the door. So you don't want these things, like Steve said, you're always gonna have, a, you always want a little bit of uh, air to be able to escape, whether it's for drainage of moisture or to make sure we can get cables and you know harnesses and whatnot through the doors without extra strain or uh, stress on them that can cause them to, to rub or break or not perform the way that they're intended to. And again, another great example from Phil Cantu, uh, Elevated Audio up in Denver. Nice, large, uh, you know, heavy duty panel bolted into place and with sound dampening uh, material on the top of it to make sure that it's, you know, they killed any potential uh, unwanted energy or noises uh, with that material panel on there as well. So this these is are great images, wanted. Rob. I love yeah. these images. You pick some yeah. really, really good ones. Uh, you know what? Hey, props <laughs> to our dealers for uh, posting their pictures when I ask for them. So uh, thanks to them for supplying these. Uh, that's why we always want to make sure we give them the credit that they deserve when uh, these types of images get supplied. Because uh, from what you guys tell us out there, you love seeing the pictures. So we try to try to get pictures for you guys. So the, the second option to seal off the doors uh, is to use sound editing material. Um, you know, we've kind of seen a couple of pictures already. Again, here's my old Honda Civic I did myself. Um, you know, that example again earlier here, Ken Smith from Superior Auto Sounds. This will be a big improvement over leaving those big holes open or just leaving the factory, you know, plastic sheet over it. It's not going to be as solid or sturdy, obviously, as a thick ABS or acrylic based panel, um, but it will seal the door off. But there'll be a little more 
you know, it'll be a little more sensitive to pressure than a plastic panel will, but this will give you a huge improvement overall. Um, again, this will help further reduce the road noise by having everything sealed with the deadening material, but you can also do that with the panel and, and deadening material as well. So if you can do a panel, do it, it'll yield the best results. But if you don't have that ability, use the sound deadening material and get those holes covered up. Now, the downside to this though, is if you do have to get into the doors or a dealership has to get into the doors at some point, they're gonna have to cut all of that out and you're gonna have to reapply it. So just, just be aware of that. And the other thing is when you do an entire door like this, you gotta be mindful of the door panels as well. You gotta make sure those panels are gonna clip into place. Depending how thick the, the, uh, the clips are on the back, adding that deadening material, some of them are thicker than others. And if you're doubling or tripling the layers, you might not be able to clip door panels back into place. I um, mean, yeah, I know my trunk on my car, when I had to get it repainted a couple years ago, I picked the car from the body shop and my rear spoiler was popping off. And I'm like, why is my spoiler? How can you guys not clip a spoiler into place? And they're like, oh, you have all of that sound deadener in your trunk and the clips won't properly grab now because it's too thick there. So just be mindful if you are gonna do the whole door, um, you know, I would, you know, try to figure out what your tolerances are, um, how much room do you have? Maybe you kind of trim a little away from the edge of the door panel. So you kind of have a, a room around it where there, you don't have the deadening material. But again, great option if you don't have the ability to make a panel, you don't have access to the materials, maybe you don't have a router, to properly create this, this is a great way to get around that and still get better results. One After, thing to also add too, is if yeah. it's a really big space that you're holding up into the door there and you're putting matting over top of that and it's just a void behind it, I would put some sort of brace um, in the middle of it uh, somehow, like maybe a plastic brace or something. Because what can happen is over time, that matting can start to get a little bit of give to it, especially if you get real warm environments. And then one day your window doesn't roll all the way down or something like that. So just uh, keep that in mind if you can. Put a brace in the middle and that way, uh, that way it keeps it from hitting any of the internals of the door. Just a little little side tip there. I did see a uh, comment on the chat just now from Scott Williams about using uh, Tessa tape around the clips to keep them from rattling. And that's a, a great, great idea as well. That'll, uh, you know, help prevent that and give you a little more uh, room potentially to work with, with the deadening material. But now that the doors are taken care of, we got to make sure those speakers are mounted properly or all of that previous work was for nothing. And the reason this is important, uh, a couple of reasons really. Um, I mean, if you've ever looked at a factory speaker, they're not that perfect six and a half inch frame. The vast majority of aftermarket speakers are. Even if it is a six and a half or maybe a six by nine, it's still on this probably this large plastic mounting catastrophe that I don't even know why they do it other than to make our lives in the aftermarket difficult. But very rarely are aftermarket speakers going to be a drop in size. So we need to make an adapter to make sure the speaker is securely mounted to the door. We don't have, again, any leakage uh, of air or pressure that could affect output and mid bass response. And again, just like those panels, we're going to need to make sure these adapters are made out of uh, heavy duty plastic, uh, starboard, acrylic, something that's dense and not going to warp. Because again, that moisture. If it's a wood-based adapter, which I see a lot, we're just asking for it to turn into a sponge and break and come apart. And don't forget about the dash. Don't forget about those rear deck and center channel and tweeter uh, speakers as well. Now we've talked a lot about the doors um, because that's where most speakers are, but the mid base, all of the stuff we're talking about improves mid base. It improves the mid range. But we need to make sure we have our dash speakers, our tweeters, if they're in A pillars or the top of the doors, that those are all installed the correct way as well, or it will compromise the performance. So this is what we do not want to see. Um, this was uh, shared to me uh, by Orlando, Orlando Prado. Uh, he is not the installer of this. He was actually fixing it. And one thing I just want to make clear, we're not making fun of every, anyone. I don't want to, you know, uh, poo poo on the install, um, laugh at it, but this is a great educational tool here. This is what we don't want to see. Um, you know, first of all, there's going to be no mid base at all from this. 
you have a six and a half inch speaker, maybe a five and a quarter in a, what looks to be a six by nine opening. There's nothing, even though mid bass is, you know, higher than bass, it still likes to see some sort of, of pressure. That's why we want to kind of make the doors into an enclosure. So by doing this, we're robbing vast amounts of mid bass performance, essentially having a mid range only speaker. There's probably no mid bass out of this. Um, obviously it's not secured properly. We only have three whole three screws on the mid range itself, one screw holding the tweeter in place. So this is what we want to avoid. Um, another one I found online, um, not the installer, but Michael Cook had shared, this is why we don't wanna use wood for our speaker adapters. It has completely come apart over time as moisture's got into it. And again, some of these materials just aren't that great. It looks like when the speaker was screwed in, it actually broke the wood apart. I'm not sure. So this is why we wanna make sure we don't use a wood-based material for our panels and our adapters. Um, and Phil up at Elevated Audio shared another great example. This is why we wanna make those adapters. On the right is a factory six by nine speaker. And look at, look at the factory adapter, you know? It's not like any aftermarket one you've seen. It's kind of a longer, weird shape. The speaker sticks out further. So what he did in the middle is beautiful and on the left without the C7 mid-range in it, is he's created an, an adapter that perfectly mimics the factory adapter to make sure that hole is perfectly covered. And then added the mounting baffle to it to flush mount the C7. And I love that he's got stainless steel hardware in there, stuff that's not gonna rust or corrode if moisture does get in the door. This is what a proper speaker mounting adapter looks like. It's That's a right really material. beautiful installation they did. Oh, it, it shows so many wow. of the right techniques and in, in practice there. It's, um, you know, when, when we go out and we shop pricing for installation efforts, if I see something like this, there's no doubt that whatever they're asking, they deserve it. They're, they're putting, they're putting it, they're putting their reputation out there. When they do something like that, it makes me smile because it's like, that's what that's what customers want whether they want to pay for it or not that's something else but ultimately that's what they want they're going to get better performance from it. it's going to be better in terms of long-term reliability so it's this elevated audio so i should have known uh, yeah so that really really well executed yeah and you know, a couple other examples uh here's one from eric in our tech support department he did recently in a porsche um again you know nice heavy duty adapter sized to the factory adapter but made to flush mount a C7 mid-range in there. So he's got the proper clearance for the window, proper clearance for the door panel. Um, just a nice, nice, and you know, there's nothing crazy about that, that panel. It's just a solid mounting adapter. And really that's, that's what we're looking for. And again, don't forget about the dash or your rear decks. Um, you know, it's working with mid-range drivers and the dash can be tough because even those have typically, um, you know, uh, a tab flange off the side to put two screws in and that's it. So I, mean, I know in my car, uh, Ramel was not able to use any of the factory mounting for my uh, C7 uh, mid-range for my center channel. So he made this acrylic adapter that the speaker mounted to from the bottom. And then that adapter mounted to the factory holes under the grill itself. So, you know, the, this is key also to make sure we have, we're not losing our mid-range performance in the dash. We're not having rattles or vibrations or potential unwanted noises. Again, a great example from Arturo at Versus Car Audio in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. You can see the nice plastic adapters they made to mount the C7 mid-range in the top corner. Another one that Phil supplied, again, nice plate mounting both the tweeter and a mid-range. It's solid, it's secure, and then he made, it looks like a nice little grill cover to go over that. This is what we wanna see when we're doing uh, dash and center channel installations. Same thing's gonna go for the rear deck, uh, for mounting it. You gotta have a proper adapter. And uh, you know, it, it makes a big difference and people don't realize what an adapter can do for you. But when done right, it's big to the performance. For the performance. It prevents that leakage, it prevents the unwanted noises we could have and make sure we're potentially getting everything we can get out of that speaker. And once we have the adapter made, we really want to make sure that we don't have any leakage. So we want to further seal the speaker to the adapter by applying, usually I say some side of type of foam gasket to the bottom of the speaker around on the mounting flange around the frame of the speaker. 
Again, those uh, foam ring kits, fast rings, and the other ones that are out there typically have like three layers. One of them is for the outer or the uh, the bottom of the speaker. Um, you can use foam tape, which in the in the dark ages when we didn't have computers and the internet and stuff, uh, Steve and Bill actually did trainings on everything we're talking about right now back in the 90s. And, you know, there weren't kits dedicated to, you know, decoupling speakers and so, you know, they would say go to Home Depot and get foam tape and put it on the back of the speaker and, you know, get thick foam tape to make a ring. I mean, JL Audio has been training on this before there were even products for any of this stuff. Um, so, you know, uh, foam tape is what Steve would have recommended in the 90s and early 2000s when, we, when right. he first started so training on this. It was like Rob saying, it was there was nothing that you could just go and buy specific for the application like we have now. We have, you know, some great options now. But back then, you'd have to go to the, the the local hardware store and find some you know suitable foam tape, mm -hmm. and sometimes you'd have to do layers of it and whatever you whatever you could do. Um, I'm going to save some more co conversation for later. I don't want to you know make us go too too long. But there's there's a lot of other things that we could talk about in terms of getting the best performance out of door speakers, in addition to but very much in line with what Rob's already talked about. So again, here's an example of what we want to see. Um, this is what Romel did um, on the C7. Uh, 650 CWs in my doors. Uh, he went a little overboard. He actually modeled the foam rings in SolidWorks, a 3D modeling program, and had them laser cut to perfectly align uh, the screw holes. I mean, I, he, he, told me he laser cut laser. Foam. Yeah. when he told me he laser cut my rings, I was like, that's just ridiculous and over the top. But again, you can also get it in the kits. Again, here's a, an example shared uh, by Eric from our tech support team. Again, with just a, you know, a, a more basic foam ring on the back you see in these ring kits. And again, it's just to make sure the speaker's properly sealed, seated, and prevent any leakiness that we uh, don't want. The final thing we need to do is decouple the speaker. And what that means is using a foam ring around the speaker's frame. And what that does is it forces the speaker's energy into the car. We're really pre working on preventing any potential energy that can get trapped inside the door panel itself. Um, obviously, that's going to, to make uh, make sure we don't have as many rattles and it's going to make it louder because instead of the energy being trapped inside the door, just about all of it is going to go right into the cabin where we're going to hear it. And I see Vanna White's got uh, some uh, uh, foam foam ring there he's got around his speaker. These are left over from some of the installs I did. I you know, figured I'd show you that. Now, granted, that's really tall. So mm -hmm. in some cases, you may need to trim it back like you see we did this on this one we trim it back so that we don't put too much pressure on the clips on the door so this one here is you know already cut back and, and real quick on the clips on the door if i tried to put this where this one actually went that pressure that would build up by trying to compress more and more of this is going to cause those clips in the door to pop off or possibly break Another tip in terms of getting good performance from your door speakers, replace the broken clips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you don't, your door is going to vibrate. No matter how much work you do on everything else, you're going to have issues. So you can usually pick them up pretty inexpensively at either the local auto parts store or you can go on to some of the online places and purchase those. Your local stereo shop may have some they'd be willing to help you out with if you, mm -hmm. you know, swing by and maybe you know buy them lunch or something. But definitely replace the clips. Yeah, absolutely. And again, these aren't just for the doors, um, you know, rear deck speakers need to be decoupled as well. We want to, if you don't do this, you're, you're losing energy that you've paid for, whether it's through the better speakers or through the uh, amplification. So get all of it and decoupling the speakers will help make sure that happens. In my car, every speaker, whether it's a three and a half inch mid range in my rear door or the uh, six and a halfs in my front doors and rear deck all have foam rings to force that energy in. Um, I even removed the factory eight inch subwoofer in my rear deck and decoupled that opening. So even though there's no speaker there, I have a foam ring around the subwoofer opening. So all of the base from my trunk is forced into the cabin instead of being trapped under the panel um, because it's been decoupled there as well. So it's a very inexpensive option that can really improve your overall output and uh, performance. And again, here's some pictures just showing some installs with that. And again, that one's my car. Um, here's one provided by Jeff Hartman. And again, like Steve said, 
you can see the way the speaker kind of comes out, the way the, the door itself is it's built. Like alien, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, clearly with the way the door panel was mounting there, he couldn't have that super thick inch ring, uh, foam ring. So they trimmed it down to make sure it's decoupled, but you're not putting excess pressure on the panel that can make it want to pop off or break clips or anything like that. Or if it's too thick, you're going to squish it down. And now you got kind of foam that's probably squishing in that could help kind of rob performance and narrow the output uh, potential of the speaker as well. So, and again, here's one from Ken Smith at Superior Auto Sounds in West Texas showing a properly decoupled speaker. So these are the steps that you really need to do um, to really get everything out of your speaker. And, uh, you know, I get it, it's tough at times. You know, I understand from as a retail uh, customer, you might be like, why am I paying you know, more, either the price of my speaker, if not more than what the speaker costs to get it installed, depending what speaker you're buying. And really, you know, we, we've discussed why you want to do this. There is value to it. For our dealers, it could be a tough sell. It's hard at times to build value in labor. It's something you're doing. It's hard to show why installing something a specific way is going to be better. Um, you know, I, I love what Steve talked about, and we'll talk about it in just a moment also, but you kind of touched that in the beginning, like, you know, speaker or, you know, install, you know, wh where are you going to fall? And there is value in a lower quality speaker with a proper install than, you know, a high level speaker with a poor installer, not going all the nines. So for our retail partners, it's very important that you build the value in this work for your customers. And yeah, you can tell them everything we've talked about, you know, it's gonna give you better output, better mid base response. You're not gonna have unwanted, it's gonna reduce unwanted noises, yada, yada, yada. But I've always been someone that I'm sold on touch and feel. So there's a great way to demo everything we've talked about if you're a, a retail partner of ours or any any car stereo shop for that matter and this actually again comes from the training steve and bill used to do um where they took you know four doors i think it was to a knowledge fest event yeah what we did was we um we went to a junkyard and we got lucky we got four identical car well roughly identical car doors <laughs> Uh, um, the same door. So it was uh, the driver's door for whatever car we bought four of them complete. Right. So with the inner uh, panel, as well as all the, the metal stuff, I think one had a missing rear view uh, side view mirror, whatever. But what we did is we kept the factory speaker in one and just kind of showed what the factory installation would be like. Then we did what we call the level one install where we took a, a coaxial speaker and we did some basic treatments to make sure that that new coaxial speaker would perform better definitely better than the you know, existing factory one. And we use small amounts of uh, damping material and things like that and you know thin foam tape to do some of the things that Rob talked about. Now we didn't have enough money left over to do the decoupling and covering the whole panel. So this was a level one. Level two was the next door panel. So we're on the third door panel. And that one, what we did was more like what Rob is describing where we used the, the damping material to cover some of the openings, not all of them, but some of those openings more, uh, liberal application of the uh, damping material on the uh, inside of the door, the, 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 the outer metal of the door. So there was more applied there. And then we did decouple. And then for the final door, the, the fourth door, we went all out. A lot of like what um, the images that Rob shared with us were, you know, they covered everything with a ABS, with all the, um, the, the damping material covering every single thing, leaving access panels, really well done doors. And uh, a couple of shops, I think Rob's got some images, took that same concept and applied it to their sh their shop. And they got a door from a, a junkyard and they did the same kind of thing where they could show, this is what your factory door is like, and this is the way we do our installation to help justify the higher cost. And one thing that I like to share as a side note here, and I'm sorry I'm taking away but the last no, no, no. time here, Rob, <laughs> is as a, as a retail salesperson, it, it, you have to remember that you, you have to build value in what you do. So uh, if, if you have a name brand, like I have some of this material here, which um, I'm not even sure what name brand it is. I, I got it from a friend of mine at a retail shop down here. It's uh, damping material. So it's got the, the backing on and off the whole line. So a customer would normally have to come into a shop and pay for that material and then pay for the application of that material, which makes sense. There's material and there's labor. You need to pay for that. But what I would recommend to a lot of retailers was when we do our installation, we use, insert the brand name here, 
of the de uh, damping material in every single installation because we believe that strongly in its, its benefit. And the benefit is there, but instead of needing the entire sheet of the damping material, you can use small nickel or quarter size pieces of it, just like on that bell demonstration and get an improvement. Now it's not gonna be gigantic, but you can definitely make the statement that we use it in every single installation to show your customer that you believe in the value of it. Now the material that you wind up using could be literally, it could be small pieces of the scrap for the crazy one that Rob showed earlier. Just grab some of the material that you cut around there and put it behind the speaker. I saw a bunch of people in the chat that were noting that you know their factory uh, installation, there is damping material that's included from the factory. And some of that is just small little like three inch squares, mm -hmm. which do that, that's fine. Doesn't cost a whole lot, doesn't take a whole lot of time and labor. You charge for the time and labor and the materials when it starts getting into more significant quantities, which will make a demonstrable difference over even the more basic application. The point here is it helps. All of it helps. Every single one of these tips that Rob has shared will help improve the performance of whatever speakers you put in there. And if I may, Rob, and then I sure. promise I'll be quiet for a little yeah, bit. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the 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 balancing act between do I I level up on speakers? Do I go from like a C1 to a C2 or a C2 to a C3 or whatever? Or do I spend that those those extra you know monetary units on something else like you know better installation, more damping material, uh, the de the decoupling rings or whatever the case may be? And again, as a manufacturer, I would normally say, well, you, you'll level up the speakers, of course, but I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you, you pay for the labor and you pay for the materials to do a better install on a lesser level product. Because if the shop does their job right, and they will, every one of you will, when the shop does their job right, you're going to love the way that speaker sounds. And the, the next thing is, how do I get better? Well, how do you get better? Then you level up. That's when you level up the speaker and your door is already ready for it. Instead of having to go through all of that again, the door is already ready for it. So again, my note to consumers out there watching, if you're concerned about maybe going from a C2 to a C3, don't go to the C3. Stick with the C2 and get some damping material, get the foam rings, do the installation like Rob was showing, and you'll get better performance than you might expect from a C2. And then you're left to wonder, how much better is that C3? Well, we'll leave you at that and I'll let Rob take over again. All right, and we'll talk about more about that in just a moment. I actually have a pretty good story about um, a speaker and uh, an install that it actually threw me off. It was actually in the car. So, but yeah, um, using the doors, this is a great way to demo. Um, if you can play audio through them, that's a, that's a really good way to do it. This is a picture I took actually um, at Audio Logic. They're a retail partner of ours in Hollywood, Florida. <laughs> and uh, Mike Dixon was at Steve's training and you know, they followed this approach, but he started to run into to some struggles where customers would ask, why are you so much more expensive for your speaker install when down the street is half the price to put a speaker in? And Mike was having a hard time building the value. So he went to a junkyard and he got two doors and he did exactly what we want. He treated uh, the top door. Uh, he doesn't have the panels on them so they can show the inside, but the, sort, the, the door's been dead end. He's got proper adapters. He's got the decoupling ring. And the other cool thing about it, the bottom door, if you can see it, it's kind of behind the stealth box. That's just a, a speaker slapped in the door, but you know, you know, a, a basic install, if you will. But the other nice thing about Mike's display is if you'll notice, he's got speakers hanging from it. So they're like, hey, here's what a factory speaker typically looks like. Here's an aftermarket speaker. Look, they don't line up. That's why we need to make this adapter. The shops down the street, well, they use wood. Look at these wood ones hanging off and they're from installs that came in from other places. Look how the wood's all swollen. The speaker's not gonna, so that's why we use plastic. So an interactive display like this for our retail partners is a great way to build the value uh, to your customers when it comes to investing in their installation. And I know it's weird to say that, you know, as a speaker company, uh, you know, just to, to say buy a lower, level product, lower tiered product and invest in the installation, but you're going to get better performance at the end of the day. Um, the, as crazy as this sounds, the very first time I heard C1650 speakers was in Eric Cole's Civic when he bought his, uh, his uh, hatchback he currently has. And um, I know he was getting it ready for his big audio system. 
and he had put a pair of C1650s in the door. And I said, oh, I want to hear them. Let me take a listen to them. They were loud. They were clean. But what blew me away was the mid bass. And to the, where I looked at him, I said, oh, wow, you put your RD400 slash four and I thought you weren't going to do that. He says, no, this is all off stock deck power. I said, what do you mean? There's no way these speakers on deck power, I know they're good speakers, but on 15 watts or whatever it may be, there's no way they have that type of mid bass. He's like, oh, well, the doors are done. So Eric following the steps that we have discussed made that, you know, $150 pair of speakers sound like they were, you know, next level product. I mean, I thought they were on three, four times the power than what they were on. 12, 15 watts of Honda power with a, you know, for us, entry level speaker, I, I would have never believed it. The mid bass was just unbelievable. The mid range was clean. The output was there. No rattles, no vibrations. So that's why when we say, you know, if you're on the fence, higher level or install, right. go install because it will make that tier below sound that much better. And I so would say you're going to get better performance from a C2 and a properly installed door than you would in a C3 or higher in a door that's not been treated properly because it just robs performance. So that kind so, of goes back to what I was rambling about at the beginning of your session, Rob, when, when manufacturers design speakers, they're anticipating at least some level of install. Yeah, I mean, it has to get put in somehow. And when we do it, we anticipate that you're doing some of the more basic stuff that you've just talked about in terms of, you know, maybe some uh, damping material, the foam rings, and you know, some of those things are already part of it. So, you know, who wasn't surprised by Eric's car? The engineers. The engineers yeah. knew that that was capable because that's what they were going for. If we're getting less performance than what the design intent was, there's only one thing that's almost certainly going to be the problem. And it's usually going to be an insufficient installation. And that's not a pitch for JL Audio product. That's a pitch for every single product that's out there on the market. There's a design intent for all of those products. And if, if you want to see what the design intent is, install it to the levels like Rob is sharing. I'd rather spend that extra money on that better installation and keep it cheap on the speakers if I had to until I could afford the better ones. I definitely don't want to go out back in and redo doors. I just want to do that once. Yep. And like Steve said, when you're ready, you can always upgrade the speaker and the doors are ready for it. And they, the performance is just going to go up from there. So, but I know we, we, we talked, we covered a lot today when it comes to uh, the basics of what a proper installation is. If you need more support, please get in touch with our technical support team. Uh, they're great at all of this stuff, whether it's designing installs, troubleshooting, um, what's the right material to use. Um, you can get in touch with them uh, by either the support link on the top of all the JL Audio pages or the help icon at the bottom of every page. You can email them technical at jlaudio.com or you can just call our main number and follow the prompts to tech support. If you need to get a hold of the training team, so Steve, Kevin, or myself, not for tech support, uh, you can reach us training at jlaudio.com and that'll filter to each of our boxes. Again, not for support, but you know, if you have training ideas, questions for us that are related more to, I guess what we do, um, you know, we're always here to uh, help as well. So um, with that, I'm gonna close my keynote out and uh, I guess we can tackle any questions that uh, didn't get answered. I, I made a comment a little while ago and I wanted to jump back to it now just so I can close it out before people start logging off on us. There was a, a lot of chatter about, you know, how far do you take covering the holes in the door? You know, how far do you really want to take that? Well, here's the thing. Take it as far as you can. Um, there's going to be a limit to everything that you guys are going to do in terms of installation. And if you're really worried about it, you could technically build an enclosure into the door panel if you're really worried about this kind of energy. But that's a lot of work, and you may not need to go that far. So um, to kind of close that part of the conversation out, there's really three main things that Rob was focused on in terms of correcting. Uh, first was for better mid-bass performance. The ceiling and keeping the, the back wave energy at lower frequencies from coming back into the interior is going to really tighten up the mid-bass performance. So stopping energy from behind the speaker 
from coming through the openings in the door into the interior. That's going to improve your mid base. The second thing was reflected energy. So he had a nice graphic where he showed that the backward motion of the cone with the energy that's reflecting off of the back, of, you know, the behind the speaker, and then coming back through, bleeding through the cone of the other materials and affecting the, the performance that way. That's going to make your mid range cleaner by addressing those things. And the third thing that he addressed was rattles and vibrational concerns. Damping material and things of that nature will help reduce some of those vibrational effects, which affects the entire spectrum of it. And I just noticed uh, who was it? It just came through. Brett mentioned a good install and make a speaker play more efficiently. I'm going to pick yeah. on you a little bit, but stay with me, Brett. Don't don't hang up. Don't, don't don't disconnect. That's not entirely true. The speaker is playing as efficiently as it was before, but the acoustic energy is now channeled more appropriately for the application. There is a reputable manufacturer of this material, this, this type of material here that used to say that you'll get 3 dB or more output or 6 dB or some number of dB more output would imply what Brett is talking about that is playing more efficiently. In fact, that's not entirely accurate. I get where they're coming from. What you're doing is you're reducing the loss of that energy. So instead of losing the energy, you're not losing the energy. So therefore, it is playing louder than it would have had you not done that. The speaker is just doing what the speaker does. It's how you're taking advantage of that acoustically that makes it appear as if it's more efficient. It's not overcoming any of the other noise issues, and that's the improvement. So Brett is actually right in his application of this information. You are getting more energy because you're not wasting any of the energy, but the speaker is not changed in any way. It's the result that has changed. It's, I know it's semantic, but just wanted to make, <laughs> make sure that was out there. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of things that we can do, but those three criteria are what we're looking for. The back wave for mid-bass performance, the uh, reflected energy for mid-range performance, and vibrational concerns using uh, damping material. If I may, there was one other question that someone asked, doesn't damping material vibrate or, or have a resonance? The truth is yes, there, everything's going to have some amount of it, but by having it heavier and adding density to it, it pushes it down in terms of its level, and it pushes it way down in terms of its frequency, so it's not going to be as affected as like when you hear the, the, the outer skin of the door start buzzing and vibrating. So, yes, everything's going to have some kind of a resonance or vibration, but you're making it harder and harder to excite that, that vibrational node. So it's, it's definitely an improvement. And I believe that same uh, person had mentioned doing layers of damping material. And most of what Rob showed, uh, especially the one that Matt uh, had done. I'm sure the other ones did too, but it was more visible in Matt's where he did the, the Xing pattern where he overlapped. So that does help quite a bit. Um, so yeah, so I think I got everything that I was excited about anyway. <laughs> Unmute here. There is one in here that I wanted to uh, to bring up um, and, and show. Brent actually asked this earlier on is the rear floor and, and rear door panel need deadening too um like he did the doors and uh and this kind of goes back to what you were just talking about steve right the the quieter you make the vehicle itself mm -hmm. internally the more performance that you're going to perceive to have in there yes. or i mean you are going to have it um it's just performance from it being quieter in the vehicle your speakers aren't aren't giving you that extra extra oomph in there or anything but uh so, i yeah. personally like to go a little wild with mine <laughs> and i do just about everything um when i'm doing a vehicle i'll actually gut the entire interior mm -hmm. um carpet headliner any of the plastic panels that i can get to um all of that stuff and i will do this i will say um, the first time I did this was a very early 2000s Audi, and I actually covered up the uh, internal vents in the vehicle, so it made it miserable to shut the doors. So just <laughs> keep that in mind, because the air, it was air so relief, tight yeah. in there um, with those vents, those just the internal vents to get out outside. Oh, yeah. it, it was just so tight that when you shut your door, you had to shut it two or three times to get it to actually go properly. So keep that in mind, um, and don't cover those up. Um, because you'll have that same type of issue. <laughs> so, I, I want to add to, to something that you just talked about in terms of where to put the energy and you know his question about the rear floor and door panel and things like that. So um, I remember a long time ago, we were doing a, a competition style vehicle and we had 
finished the front of the vehicle and bu kind of buttoned it up, but we hadn't actually done the back yet. And for whatever reason, we only put the damping material up in the front floorboards, up in the doors and in the front. And when you drove the car, you heard road noise from behind you. Cause you, it, it, you know, it's not just audio that that's improved. It's also right. the sound from the outside to the inn and the rumbling of the, of the road and whatnot. But you could actually hear that rumble sound from behind it. Like, what the heck is going oh, That's because we didn't do damping back there yet. <laughs> so, yeah, um, if you're going to do it, I, try to do it everywhere. I mean, maybe and if you have to scale back and do less of it everywhere, that might be better. Um, it, it, you just kind of have to weigh it a little bit. I remember having customers come in and having us do their entire car, like, you know, Kevin said, gutting it, doing the floor, the doors, the roof, the trunk. And they didn't even have audio systems. It was a commuter car. And, you know, he just bought a cheap car with good mileage to drive uh, 80 miles each way. He said, and it loaded it up with a few hundred pounds of material. So darn loud. <laughs> we, I mean, we, it was like, you know, a couple thousand dollars worth of deading material and installation just to quiet his drive down so he could listen while he listened to am radio so it's you know it's not, yeah it helps with speakers but if you have a loud vehicle you're in it a lot that road noise bugs you it, it makes a big difference when it comes to quieting down the cabin and remember folks we don't sell it so so I'm going to help Kenneth out here real quick. He's asking about um, uh, arcade cabinets real quick here, since we got, got a, a lot, a lot of everything else kind of, uh, kind of. I want to see it. this arcade because he was talking about it in one of our previous sessions. Um, if he needed a tweak for it, I was like, man, a tweak on an arcade. That thing's got to sound crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it all depends on how you're setting up the speakers that are internal on this. If I'm doing a large enclosure like that, and, and I've done some enclosures for in my office and stuff like that, I actually take away any of the hard corners of the internal enclosure um, to start with, and I'll stack those enclosures so that way I can offset the, uh, the, the way the the round overs, I should say, and really just make it as, as round and as, as no standing waves or anything like that as possible back there. Um, you could put some material on there um, and it will help you out. You can also do uh, a little bit of fiberglass inside there and kind of do some sound um, deadening material along with that fiberglass to, to help you out inside that uh, actual um, enclosure on there too. A lot of different ways you could tackle that. Um, those are just a few uh, quick suggestions for you. Um, and, uh, and maybe we'll uh, take a look. I see there's not a lot of space. So maybe the fiberglass going that route um, with a little bit of sound uh, deadening material will really help you out there. If anyone's interested, his profile picture shows that arcade console. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. freaking awesome. So it's <laughs> very cool. So, Rob, that was really good stuff. And um, what I really like is it shows how anyone can get better performance from even the speakers they may already have. Um, again, <laughs> from recent experience, make sure you have clips. <laughs> replace the clips. Um, and you know, get, get back in there and, and do what you need to do to, to make whatever speakers you're currently using sound better if you haven't already done this stuff. Um, Rob, what I really like that you shared is a bunch of different retailers from all over this country that does that. And, of course, you had some from Canada, too. But I know our, our buddy over in Europe, he was on earlier. There he is. <laughs> Car Sounds. Um I know they're doing similar things as well. So th this this is great that so many shops are understanding the importance of proper installation. It's not just the wiring. And it's you know all, all these other things. It's it's things like the damping material. It's things like the foam, and it's just things like the proper spacers. And these things all make a really really big difference. And we encourage you to use as much of it as you can reasonably get into your budget. I'd rather you sacrifice and not go to that C three level product or or stretch for a C seven. Let's do the doors right and show what our less expensive product can really do because that's what we intended it for to allow for those installations where you don't have tons and tons of money to throw at things just do that installation right that's what we want to see and i think it'll be a surprise from us and other companies yep. all right so kev how are we doing are we kind of i think we're uh, pretty good there i think we're pretty good 
<laughs> Daniel makes a comment. Wasn't sound deadening in the 70s? Shag pile carpet. <laughs> that was the 80s, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, it, what's interesting is what what those thicker materials like the carpeting or whatever. Some shops would actually use that to fill in gaps between vibrating panels. Mm -hmm. Again, like Rob was saying before, some of this material was not commonly available. The foam materials were not commonly available. So if you had thick carpet, all kidding aside, Daniel, yeah, you could have used that in some of these applications. Certainly not all, but yeah, I mean, whatever you got to do. Um, you know, my comment earlier about car audio specific materials. They address things like temperature and some of the residue that might be existing from the manufacturing process of the vehicles. You know, these things can all have an effect. And someone made a comment about, um, you know, treating the, the surfaces before you apply some of this stuff. That can make a huge difference. Um, you know, a lot of people just skip that step. Ah, I don't have time for that. Don't skip that step. Rubbing alcohol out and scrubbing yeah, yeah, it out. Yeah, I use a, a multi-purpose bleachy type of cleaner that goes in there and really gets it on there. Don't uh, don't don't use tire wet or something. To go no, in there no. <laughs> One other thing that I want to point out, and this is experience talking here, folks. Some of this stuff has like a metal surface to it yeah. that, when you cut, becomes very very sharp. Ooh. And some of my injuries <laughs> remain from my install time. I'm not so whether, good at the install stuff. I'll, I'll stick whether with it's from the material itself or reaching up inside of a door yes, and it gets your arm to get cut up when you put that stuff in. Which is why your shop is charging you for the install. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, that's enough for now. Um, <laughs> so, Rob, thank you again for putting together a really excellent presentation. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your images with us. And especially thank you for the feedback and comments. You make the chat really exciting and interesting. You guys make our trainings better, and we appreciate that. So on that note, we're going to uh, say good night or good afternoon or good morning, depending where you're at. And we'll look forward to seeing you the next time around. Thanks for watching. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.